Right, let's start. Good evening and welcome back for the second in our series of 2021 webinars from Ophthalmic Consultants of London. My name is Purvi Thompson and I will be hosting tonight's session. A few points before we start. This webinar is recorded and will be available to view along with the previous webinars on our YouTube channel at Pharmic Consultants of London. There is one CET point available for optometrists and dispensing opticians for tonight's session. And it will be given if you are watching live with the registration that you received when you logged in. You must also stay for the duration of the CET. This lecture will run for approximately 45 minutes with questions at the end. So if you do have any questions as the webinar progresses, please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and we will get to them at the end of the session. So for tonight, I am very excited to introduce a new speaker for Ophthalmic Consultants of London, Mr. Chen Wong. Chen is director and partner of OCL and he's also our retinal lead. He's a consultant ophthalmologist and vitreoretinal surgeon at three leading NHS hospitals, Moorfields Eye Hospital, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children and the Royal Free. He is an expert in vitreoretinal surgery in adults, managing conditions ranging from eye floaters, epiretinal membranes, diabetic retinal eye disease, retinal detachments, with a super specialist interest in pediatric retinal detachments and vitreoretinal disorders. So that's enough of me. Over to you, Chen. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Puri. Um, that's a very, very kind introduction. Um, let me. Um, switch to screen sharing. Can you see my screen? Yeah. yeah, absolutely perfect. Thanks, Chen. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, so my topic today is referring to the vitro retinal service. What, why, and when? Uh, in terms of um, my work at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Uh, I, I run the UK National Centre for Retinal Detachment in Premature Babies. So the key points of my talk today are floaters and posterior vitreous detachment, retinal detachment, vitro retinal macular interface abnormalities, uh, that's VMT, epiretinal membrane, full thickness macular holes, uh, and advanced diabetic eye disease. So conditions that you uh, would come across over the course of your, your career, uh, certainly as an optometrist. So here's an example of an early retinogenous retinal detachment. There's a horseshoe tear or a U tear on the, on the top uh, left of the screen there with a limited retinal detachment demarcated by the arrows <coughs> pointing to, to RRD. So the macula is spared uh, and the, vision, the patient is 6-6 vision. Now, if these patients are uh, left or missed, or there's delayed referral, then this can happen when there is a, a total retinal detachment and typically patients have in the hand motions uh, vision at, at this point and the visual prognosis is much worse in spite of treatment. <clears throat> so you as an optometrist, uh, you are an important partner uh, to us. You have a, a critical healthcare role in the community to identify early disease before irreversible sight loss. So firstly, floaters. Um, so in this uh, study uh, done in 2007, it showed that in the UK optometrists on average, see 14 patients per month with floaters. So that's, you know, that would equate to 168 patients a year, which is quite a lot of patients. Uh, <clears throat> so let's consider the vitreous uh, gel and why floaters develop. So the vitreous gel is transparent. This is a sample on the right uh, from Jerry uh, Sabak's uh, publication showing the vitreous body of a nine-month-old child. And behind it is the surgical drape. So notice how transparent the vitreous gel is. Um, 
it's made of 98% to 99% water and 1-2% solid. Uh, and the, remark the remarkable clarity is conferred uh, by a structured molecular framework, like so. So what is a vitreous uh, floater? So here's an example of a patient Optos uh, video showing floaters in the inferior vitreous state of this patient uh, and, a, and, a, and a retro illumination uh, image showing vitreous capacities in the vitreous cavity. So it, it, it is due to vitreous liquefaction or sceneresis or degeneration, they're all kind of synonymous really, leading to opacities in the vitreous. Um, and these opacities, uh, as light enters the eye, uh, they cast shadows on the retina uh, and they appear as, as floaters or opacities. They are also called uh, musque volitantes or, or Latin for flying flies. And you, see, you hear patients describing them as flies. Um, Floaters float, so they drift and move in and out of vision. So they're intermittent. And they, they, they tend to come and go, and you, you can you can patients can move them around by, by by moving their eye around. So there are other causes of vitreous uh, opacities, um, which I won't spend much uh, time on. Vitreous hemorrhage, inflammation, potentially cancer. But the most common is vitreous liquefaction or sinuresis whether there's a PV, PVD, a posterior vitreous detachment or not. Uh, PVD is a culmination of vitreous uh, liquefaction. And it starts, uh, typically starts posteriorly uh, where there is an opening in the posterior hyaline uh, face, the fluid uh, in the vitreous body uh, gets through that, gets behind uh, the vitreous uh, body uh, and then separates it from the retina as shown. What causes PVD? Um, it increases with age, so 70% of people by the age of 70 uh, typically have it. Um, it increases with uh, increasing myopia, as shown in this graph. Uh, intraocular surgery uh, brings forward the onset of PVD and any vitreous disease such as uh, inflammation, uh, previous trauma, uh, etc. So what's the consequence of PVDs? Once the vitreous is separated from the retina, you can see as the eye, the saccadic eye movements, the vitreous is kind of whipping around, uh, attached to the, uh, the anterior, to, to the oris errata anteriorly. So it's, it's kind of pulling at the vitreous base the whole time, um, as, as shown. Um, and the, the, the vitreous is uh, completely adherent uh, to uh, the, the retina and the um, aura uh, at the vitreous base. So this is a, a uh, view of the um, vitreous base from behind the eye. So imagine you're standing at the optic nerve and looking uh, at the, um, the back of the uh, iris and through the pupil out uh, to the cornea. So on the left is a it's a norm it's a kind of uh, normal uh, PVD um, so to speak uh, whereby there is even separation of the vitreous uh, from the retina uh, going anteriorly as shown by the blue arrows. The image on the right uh, shows a um, a non anomalous uh, PVD whereby uh, indicated by the red arrows there's an area where the vitreous is uh, more adherent uh, to the retina, uh, slightly further back, and therefore the, the vitreous is not able to separate at that point. Now, when the vitreous everywhere else uh, uh, separates more interiorly, uh, then you can, you can imagine there would be a focal point uh, indicated by the red arrows where there's increased uh, force um, as the vitreous body is, is moving around and that potentially predisposes to, to retinal breaks. So a classic example of increased vitreous retinal adhesion posterior to the vitreous base is lattice degeneration, uh, which many of you would have seen. This is uh, most uh, common in myopes. Uh, and there is increased vitreous retinal adhesion at the, at the border of, of the lattice uh, with retinal uh, thinning and atrophic areas uh, within it. 
uh, whereby you can sometimes uh, develop uh, atrophic retinal pores. And there's an overlying uh, lacunae uh, whereby um, the, the vitreous is slightly more optically uh, empty, uh, in, overlying the atrophic area. So this is an example of an area of lattice degeneration. And as the vitreous peels away, because there is a focal point of attachment, increased attachment, um, rather than the vitreous peeling away from the retina, it, pe it peels the, the retina off the wall of the eye with the vitreous and cause a retinal tear. Here's another example of a retinal tear in lattice causing a retinal attachment. So how do we diagnose posterior vitreous attachment? Well, the classic example is using a vice ring. Um, by, by, by identifying a vice ring, often overlying the optic disc or, in, in, or in, in close vicinity to it. So on the left uh, is an image uh, from Dean Elliott. Um, it's been published, it shows a, it's a very nice example. On the right is a vice ring, but the, the posterior hyaloid face um, is slightly uh, opacified. So it's, you, you can see how that, that can also uh, cause uh, greater issues with, with floaters. <clears throat> Symptomatic clauses. Here's a more typical example. Um, so the image on the right is an optos image. So you can see that there is um, indicated by the blue arrow a, a kind of dark um, uh, ring, but it's not an obvious complete ring. Uh, and that is, in fact, a vice ring. In, the, in this example, is not immediately in front of the optic disc. So sometimes you have to look around for it. And um, using the, um, with coaxial illumination on, uh, with a super few lens on the left, you can see this vice ring is, it's not that obvious that it's, you know, it's circular. So you, you kind of, you know, have to, to um, um, you know, use a combination of, of clues and, and imaging can, can sometimes help. OCT can be helpful. Uh, so optical coherence tomography imaging, um, which um, many of you will have in your practices. So this is, uh, in fact, an image uh, that was taken at 1625 today of uh, one of the patients I saw this afternoon, um, showing um, one uh, vitreous attached in the right eye attached to the optic disc. Uh, and you can, you can see from the, the, the brown line on the, on the left there where, where the, the that slice was taken um, uh, just at the inferior edge of the, of the disc, and there's an epiretinal membrane. And similarly, in the right eye, uh, the vitreous is, is partial separation overlying the macula, uh, but it's still attached at the disc. So you would not see a vice ring. Uh, this is not a complete vitreous separation. Uh, I just want, I, I thought this was interesting to, to show. This is uh, an epiretinal membrane in a uh, young child I did uh, recently. Um, with a dense epiretinal membrane, and I'm surgically or mechanically inducing the posterior vitreous attachment starting at the optic disc. And you can see a, uh, a, a ring that's extending out. There you go, that's, that's, that should be quite obvious there, uh, showing the propagation of the PVD. So, so when you see a patient with a potential PVD, a suspect, suspected PVD with you know, floaters, you, you need to be able to examine it peripheral retina. So here are a couple of tips for examining the, the peripheral retina optimally. You want a well-dilated pupil, uh, so that is essential. Uh, and I, I, I like to use the Volk Superfield lens. I have no financial interest in these lenses. Um, and you want to move the lens as close to the patient's cornea as possible, which can be tricky uh, in the current uh, age of uh, patients having to wear masks. Uh, so I, I tend to ask the patients to pull the mask just below the nose momentarily. Uh, and I have a, I have a I'm wearing a mask and it's a, it's a clear shield between me and the, the patient. Um, but that allows you to move the, 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 the lens close to the patient's cornea without the lens fogging. Uh, as you can see, you know, as you get closer, the image moves towards the, the right there and, you, and, and a retinal tear then becomes visible. You need to refer uh, PVDs um, not if there is, a ret there is no retinal tear found after you are comfortable that you've done uh, a thorough peripheral dilated examination. 
uh, it's useful to, I, I, I've not written here, it's useful to also look for pigmented cells in the anterior vitreous, um, you know, sometimes called tobacco dust, uh, you know, anterior vitreous pigment is, is probably more, more apt uh, these days. Um, and that, that can indicate um, RPE cells that have come through retinal pigment epithelial cells that have been dispersed uh, at the site of a retinal tear and, and they come forward to the anterior vitreous. Uh, so if you, if you don't see that uh, uh, as well, then you can give the patient a retinal detachment uh, warning advice, symptoms to look out for and discharge the patient. So what are retinal detachment, what sort of retinal detachment warning advice do I give patients? Um, I tell them two things primarily. One is uh, look for a scotoma or a curtain coming across the vision uh, that is persistent uh, and uh, may increase um, um, and edge towards the central vision uh, and a significant uh, sudden increase in filters. Yeah, I think flashes, uh, flashing lights tend to be a bit more, uh, a bit less specific. So uh, indications for urgent same day referral. Uh, so if you see a patient with a suspected retinal tear, you know, certainly a retinal attachment or a vitreous hemorrhage of unknown cause, in other words, the patient is not diabetic, um, then you know, vitreous hemorrhage of unknown cause, you would really have to exclude uh, PVD related hemorrhage and associated retinal tear. So you want to refer the patient the same day, ideally. So let's talk a little bit about regmatogenous retinal detachment. Regma uh, is uh, the Greek word for rupture or rent. And regmatogenous retinal detachment is separation of the neurosensory retina from the retinal pigment epithelium associated with a full thickness hole or tear in the retina, allowing vitreous fluid to enter, to go through the break to enter the subretinal space. So the retina is stripped off the wall of the eye and detaches from the wall of the eye. So in 1918, uh, that was when Jules Godin first described the treatment of retinal uh, breaks, uh, causing retinal detachment with a 30 to 40 percent retinal reattachment rate. So that was just over 100 years ago. So the incidence of RRD is about one in 10,000. The risk increases with high myopia. So risk of RRD to myopia, fellow eye detachment. So this is quite interesting, isn't it? I mean that there is a study showing five to 23 percent. Uh, chance of developing detachment in the fellow eye, which suggests a uh, genetic predisposition um, in these cases. Prior cataract surgery also increases the risk of detachment, about a four-fold increase in this Danish study of over 200,000 patients over a 10-year period. Um, they compared a detachment rate in uh, patients who affect unilateral uh, cataract uh, surgery uh, and um, they found a fourfold increase. Uh, trauma also increases the risk. So symptoms, uh, sudden onset of uh, um, visual field defect or peripheral uh, uh, scotoma, uh, the reduced visual acuity uh, once the macula is reduced, uh, but the patient can sometimes also be asymptomatic if, they, if it is affecting their non-dominant eye. So what the, there are three types of retinal breaks um, that cause retinal Attachment. One is the, the classic is the U tear, uh, retinal tear, U tear, horseshoe tear, flap tear, state is synonymous. Uh, and it occurs following a PVD at the site of increased vitreous retinal adhesion, as I've mentioned, and it generally progresses quite rapidly. And this, the rate of progression tends to be proportional to the size of the tear. You can also get retinal holes. So those are atrophic holes without PVD. Um, usually with localized retinal atrophy um, and, and round holes often in, in lattice degeneration. Um, and the post-mortem eyes have shown that 10% uh, of um, uh, eyes can have holes without, without attachment. So they, they're probably more common than we, than we think. Uh, dialysis is when there is circumferential retinal break that occurs along the aura serrata with avulsion of the vitreous base uh, with no uh, retinal retina visible anterior to the break, uh, and it's often associated with trauma. So number two and three tend to occur in younger patients, and number one and generally in, in older patients, you know, over, 40, for, over the age of uh, 45 uh, to 50. 
This is a, an example of chronic uh, retinal detachment, secondary limited retinal tear. So, there it, so it's, it, it's chronic probably because it's increased slowly, the, the hole is, the retinal tear is quite small. And sometimes that, that can lead to a more gradual increase in the scotoma, which may not be obvious to the patient. Uh, there is retinal scarring, uh, pre-retinal scarring, uh, known as proliferative vitro retinopathy. Uh, and you can see all the kind of uh, foresight of um, membrane ca causing kind of what we call star falls uh, that, that reduce the, the chance of retinal reattachment uh, with, with surgery. So what are the treatment options? You have uh, vitrectomy. Uh, it's the commonest uh, treatment option, um, otherwise known as pass plana vitrectomy, because the surgical access is through the sclera uh, uh, through the pass plana. Uh, less than 10% of cases have scleral buckling uh, surgery, and the one that tend to have scleral buckling surgery are ones with retinal hole or dialysis. Uh, and everybody else tends to have vitrectomy unless it's, it's, it's a young patient before uh, presbyopia has kicked in. So here's a, here's a, here's a case I did uh, recently, um, um, on Monday in fact, um, showing a three-port uh, vitrectomy with 25 uh, gauge surgery. So these the sclerotomy uh, ports are um, 0 0.5 millimeters uh, wide and self-sealing, it's a pseudophagic patient. Um, we have a, a inverting uh, lens. Uh, here's a macular off, uh, macular involving or macular off detachment. Um, you can see the edge of the optic there quite nicely. Uh, the vitrectomy is uh, being done. You can see detachment in the, top, in the top half of the screen there. This patient has, uh, uh, in this video, a giant retinal tear. So it's a very large tear that's three or more clock hours uh, in size, um, as shown. Uh, and here, I'm, I'm reattaching the retina, injecting a uh, something called uh, per floral optane, which is heavier than, than water, and it sinks. So it pushes the fluid out of the subretinal uh, space and reattaches the retina. And then I can, I can do my uh, laser retinopexy as shown, as shown here uh, to uh, seal uh, the retinal breaks. So this patient requires silicone oil because it was an inferior uh, break and an inferior large break. Here's a different uh, patient, uh, a lady in her uh, 60s, uh, presenting with acute onset uh, shadow and an inferior peripheral vision, and there is a superior retinal detachment there. Um, here is the surgery. Uh, this case was done a few weeks ago uh, at OCL, uh, showing two small uh, retinal breaks, and that is quite typical of pseudophagic patients where they tend to present with small anterior breaks. breaks. So there's a vitrectomy being done there, and the breaks are there's a vitrectomy done over the retinal break with flattening of the retina um, as the subretinal fluid is being removed. This is one week post stop. Uh, so we put in the gas bubble. It's a 60% gas bubble. The inferior retina is attached. There's still gas at the superior retina. Uh, so we can only determine the final outcome after the gas is completely uh, resolved um, by the body. So this is the patient uh, turned up today, four weeks post stop. Uh, the gas bubble is gone. Uh, the visual acuity has returned to 6.6 uh, and the retina is has fully reattached. Sclerobuckling uh, surgery is done uh, less commonly, like I mentioned, uh, and it's an external eye procedure uh, and essentially there a silicon uh, band or a belt loop of some sort is placed on the sclera and sutured to the wall of the eye. So with vitrectomy, what we do is that we we push the retina up against the wall of the eye with the gas bubble on the inside, whereas with scleral buckling sur surgery is an external procedure where we're pushing the wall of the eye into the retina uh, um, and, and supporting the retina that way and the cryotherapy is being done here um, to reattach the retina. These tend to be done in younger patients. In terms of outcome surgery, there's an 80 to 90% primary retina reattachment rate. Uh, the, 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 the rate is slightly lower in pseudofix uh, because they tend to have smaller breaks, which uh, sometimes are not visible, uh, even during uh, surgery under the surgical microscope. Um, therefore, they have a slightly increased uh, risk of uh, retinal reattachment. So in a recent study published last uh, year, the uh, uh, study of about 4,000 uh, eyes, uh, they showed that the rate of retinal reattachment with pseudofix patients was 85% and uh, 88 or 89% with faking patients. 
Uh, Pseudofixals tend to have uh, more inferior attachments, which can, which can uh, uh, have a slightly in increased chance of surgical failure. Uh, here's an example of a 30-year-old uh, female uh, who's not a, not a myope with two history of floaters. Um, and here's a nice, beautiful video from uh, one of my colleagues showing a, a vice ring. And it's easy to attribute symptoms to that. But here you see a posterior pole, uh, white kind of area uh, in the retinal uh, space. Um, when you look at the anterior segment, um, these are keratic precipitates uh, due to anterior levitis. And this patient, uh, in fact, had um, toxoplasma or retinitis. Um, so this is inflammation related rather than PBD related and the, the patient's symptoms. Here's a, a different uh, case, a 45 year old uh, myope with a PBD this time uh, as well. Um, we chopped some floaters and it was a taxi driver. So you can, this is a video from, from this uh, site uh, showing how somebody who's driving may experience floaters. So is treatment for floaters justified? You know, I think it is important to it is useful to um, understand that the, the, the surgical treatment of vitrectomy in general has evolved uh, uh, a lot over the past um, um, 10 years. Uh, and the, the, the risk of uh, retinal break formation uh, and retinal detachment during vitrectomy has significantly uh, reduced. Um, when I was a, a trainee uh, at, at Morpheus um, uh, over a decade ago, um, you know, we did a, a study published in ophthalmology that showed uh, a, a rate of hydrogenic retinal uh, break of um, over 5% uh, in with 20 gauge vitrectomy. Uh, but in, in these days, with um, 23, 25, or even 27 gauge smaller uh, vitrectomy, i.e., we're using smaller gauges, the rate is much less than 1% or, or, or less in some cases. So um, there, there are you know, people that offer YAG laser for floaters. Um, YAG laser breaks up floaters. So if there's a large uh, floater, it would break it up into smaller pieces. However, it does not remove the floaters. Uh, therefore, you can change the patient's symptom from one large floater to multiple small floaters. So is YAG laser for floaters or YAG vitrolysis, as it's sometimes called, safe? These are two publications from 2018 showing uh, inadvertent iotrogenic posterior capsule rupture uh, following YAG laser. This, is, you know, this, is, this can be a, uh, an ophthalmic emergency because if you rupture the capsule, the cortex of the lens starts to leak into the eye, it can cause inflammation, you, you, know, you get an acute uh, cataract and the, the eye pressure can go up, etc. So this is a, this would be a pretty bad uh, situation to be, to be faced with. Um, here's an interesting study published in 2017 uh, by the uh, American Society of Retinal Specialists uh, Research and Safety and Therapeutics Committee. Uh, this was uh, self-reporting uh, over a six month period. Uh, and there were 16 reported complications following YAG laser vitrolysis. Complications including raised IOP leading to glaucoma, cataracts, posterior capsule, including posterior capsule defects requiring cataract surgery, retinal tear, retinal attachment, retinal hemorrhages. Uh, imagine if you if you the, the YAG was close to the macula, that, that would be a disaster really. Um, if you cause a macular hole from, from YAG laser. Um, scotomas and increased number of floaters, as I discussed. So I, I do not offer um, YAG laser, and I do not uh, believe it is an effective treatment option. So what is the natural history of floaters? Uh, when you have a patient in front of you in your practice, what can you say to them? Um, there can be a varying degree of patient anxiety. Um, so floaters increase with greatest um, vitrocinuresis, uh, liquefaction, uh, especially in myopes. It can change over time, and it does tend to change over time. Uh, it doesn't lead to blindness in the absence of any other pathology. And often the brain can get accustomed to, the, to floaters and, and suppress them. So typically, you know, after a couple of months or so, uh, so if I see a patient presenting with troublesome floaters, 
uh, and its new onset endeavors in any other pathology, um, I don't tend to offer them directly at the outset. I tend to go through the, the, the options, uh, the risk of benefits of, and of treatment, and then give them some time to see if they get accustomed to and, and then suppress uh, the symptoms. Occasionally, floaters can lead to uh, an impact on the daily quality of life. Uh, and for some patients, it can be quite debilitating. So in, in those patients, surgery uh, can be an effective, an effective option. So vitrectomy for vitreous floaters. Uh, the benefits is that it permanently removes uh, floaters. So I, I tend to say the patient it removes most of the floaters, not necessarily every single floater, but certainly the visible ones in the central vitreous, uh, those would all be removed. And remember the vitreous base is, um, you know, can't be removed. And, and sometimes after surgery, the odd floater that's inoculated in the vitreous base can be released for surgery. So I, you know, I, I tend to um, put a lot of effort into ensuring patients have realistic expectations about the treatment. Uh, and the benefit of, of vitrectomy as well is that because it clears the vitreous cavity, uh, it often improves contrast sensitivity. And that's something that I've been measuring for a while and that change can sometimes be quite dramatic, uh, objectively and subjectively. Uh, risk, so patients can get cataract. Uh, so if a patient is age 50 or over, uh, there's probably a 50% chance of developing a cataract uh, within two years. Uh, that risk would increase if we have to put an air or gas bubble in the eye, which often isn't the case. Um, there's up to a 1% chance of retinal attachment. In reality, it, it's, it's lower than that. Um, in, you know, in our OCL experience, and there's a risk with any uh, surgery or severe infection bleeding to cause blindness of about one in a thousand. Let's consider asymptomatic uh, retinal lesions. Um, so lattice degeneration of retinal hosts do not require treatment. Um, there is no data, uh, including uh, publication in the Cochrane uh, database that did not show uh, any robust evidence to support uh, treatment. Therefore, we do not uh, treat these. So that's, these are round atrophic retinal holes, not retinal tears or flap tears. Um, you know, patients understandably can be quite concerned about uh, you know, having any sort of retinal pathology. And I think uh, in that context, you know, um, a, um, an annual optometry uh, review for some of these patients uh, is, could certainly be considered and offered very reasonably. Um, patients that need treatment, even if they're asymptomatic, uh, uh, is when there is a retinal tear or a flap tear. Why? Because a retinal tear is due to vitreous pulling off the retina. So the vitreous is by definition still attached to the, uh, the flap and is continuing to pull uh, on uh, the retinal tear with saccadic eye movements. So uh, this patient is at increased risk of uh, retinal detachment and I would uh, treat this with retinopexy. So in summary, uh, floaters, if you see a patient with floaters, do inflammation, is there a PVD, I check the retinal periphery. Uh, if, you, if you suspect a retinal tear or is there's unexplained uh, vitreous hemorrhage, um, uh, refer the patient urgently for, for seeing the assessment by a visual retinal surgeon. Uh, if it's vitrocinuresis or liquefaction, uh, you can reassure the, the patient and mention some of the things I, I've, this, I've uh, shared with you. Uh, and vitrectomy can be an option uh, in selected patients and with um, appropriate patient selection, um, in my experience, it works uh, very well. Let's move on to some macular uh, disorders. So, so these are grouped uh, under the heading of vitro retinal interface abnormalities. So they include vitro macular traction, VMT, epiretinal membrane, ERM, or full thickness macular hole. Uh, so this was an interesting study. It was published in 2017. It was a UK biobank population study of half a million patients. So they looked at a quarter of these uh, uh, of patients uh, with um, a quarter of these uh, patients with some degree of visual impairment. Um, and uh, they found interestingly that 8.1% uh, 8, 8 of eyes had uh, 
either VMT, ERM, or macular hole um, without visual uh, impairment. So they, you know, they can be asymptomatic. So it, it's, it's likely more common in the, in the population than we realize. What's interesting is that they've, they've classified visual impairment as worse than 6, uh, 12, um, which seems, um, uh, you know, seems, you know, it's, I mean, 612 is kind of legal driving standards, and I, I guess that that's probably the rationale, but, you know, reduction of vision to 612 uh, can be quite debilitating, or, you know, even 6, even 69 with distortion. Symptoms of, of uh, this group of conditions, it can be asymptomatic, um, particularly in the non-dominant eye, uh, they can have blurring of vision, central visual distortion. So ERM typically causes macropsia. Why? Uh, because there is an ERM in the center of the macula that's contracting and pulling photoreceptors towards the center of that. So you're increasing the density uh, of uh, photoreceptors within, within a, a particular area, and, and therefore um, things look bigger, whereas a macular hole, you're decreasing the density of photoreceptors, uh, and therefore things, things look, you know, there are less um, photoreceptors um, uh, interpreting an image uh, that's, that's being projected onto the retina. So a macular hole is shown there with the retina splitting open um, like, a, like a drawbridge. Um, and patients can have a, a blind spot or something. So vitro macular traction is due to increased enteral Posterior vitromacular adhesion, um, so vertical adhesion with surrounding uh, vitreous separation. Um, OCT studies have shown spontaneous resolution of 30 to 50 percent, particularly when the, the base uh, of the attachment is narrower. So the broader the base, the less likely it is to spontaneously resolve. Uh, there was a study that was published quite a while back. Uh, the five year natural history uh, pre OCT era. So, so these are probably patients with more severe disease. Uh, over five years, they can have 67% you know, of two or more lines of uh, visual reduction. Here's a, a case uh, of a 58 year old a female with mild blurred vision in the left eye, vision QT69, uh, near vision N8. So there's this. A focal VMT with some intraretinal uh, cysts or macular edema uh, there. Now, five months later, what's interesting is that the patient presented with uh, a short two week history of reduced vision in that same eye, dropping to 618 in N12. Uh, and this, this, this is due to progression to a stage 1B macular hole. Uh, patient had uh, surgery. Uh, and uh, vision, uh, near vision uh, improved to N4.5, uh, distance uh, vision uh, improvement uh, was uh, less uh, to 615. What about macular holes? Uh, so the most common cause is idiopathic, and the, this is due to tangential and uh, enteral uh, posterior traction at the fovea. Uh, so there are two uh, vectors, uh, two different vectors compared two vectors compared to one vector uh, with VMT. Uh, it's due to residual uh, cortex on the retinal surface, causing gliocell proliferation, congestion traction, and then the, the fulvia splits open at its, um, at its thinnest uh, point. Uh, so these are the potential stages of a macular hole from stage uh, uh, one to four, and, and stage four is when there is a complete uh, PED. So let's consider the treatment and outcomes of macular hole. Uh, so the, 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 the treatment uh, of choice is to track me with peeling of the internal limiting membrane and gas tamponade. Uh, there's over 90% uh, primary hole closure rate. Uh, and about half of uh, about half, uh, the patients get two lines of more, or more of uh, vision improvement. And I tend to tell patients that the, um, that, you know, because there is disruption to the anatomy, uh, that vision uh, does not return uh, back to normal, no matter how good the result is, then there is likely to be some persistent uh, distortion. Uh, face down posturing following a surgery is debated, uh, and it's been shown in an RCT uh, by one of my colleagues uh, that uh, it, it, it probably has some benefit in larger holes. 
What are the determinants of better visual outcomes? Uh, data for two recent multi-center uh, studies uh, published within the last 12 months uh, showed that patients with smaller holes uh, and earlier surgery do better. Um, what's interesting with earlier surgery is that if you look at the percentage of uh, patients in this study of 327 eyes that achieved six over 7.5 vision or better, which is an excellent outcome after macular surgery, 70% um, of 70.6% of them achieved it if they had surgery within one week of develop, developing symptoms. Uh, you know, typically uh, in the NHS, you know, patient, this, these patients are treated routinely, uh, and it's often you know months from the point of referral to surgery. Um, but you know, this this paints a, a potentially different picture to to you know what patients may want to consider as an alternative, or what you may want to to consider um, suggesting. Um, um, or discussing with the patient uh, as to you know other avenues to to pursue if, if as earlier um, surgery um, could lead to a better outcome and certainly uh, appears to be the case uh, in the study. It's always important to consider what's happening with the other eye, so the feather eye. Um, so the right eye here is a full thickness macular hole. Um, in the left eye there is no PVD, the OCT shows an attached vitreous endophobia, uh, and there is a 20% chance of developing a macular hole over five years, um, and that risk um, uh, goes once the PVD develops, um, but 20% chance over five years is not insignificant, uh, and it's important to share with the patient because that may influence what they decide to do uh, with the eye that has a macular hole. Um, and epiretinal membrane, um, idiopathic epiretinal membranes are commonest, secondary causes including, uh, include branch retinal vein occlusion, retinal tear, a previous retinal detachment, uveitis trauma, uh, and um, a PVD or, or, part, or even a partial vitreous separation uh, leaves some residual vitreous cortex, and there can be breaks in the ILM that lead to, again, scar tissue and glial cell proliferation. So as opposed to VMT and macular hole, um, so VMT is an anteroposterior traction, macular hole is anteroposterior and tangential traction, the ERM is tangential traction only. Signs, sheen on the retina, they can have a pseudo hole, um, you know, the, the appearance of, of a hole, but it's really, uh, of, of a possible hole, but it's really just really thick and uh, retina, uh, distortion of retinal blood vessels. And a negative prognostic feature is disruption of the ellipsoid zone, uh, the ultra retina. I thought I'd show this interesting case uh, on the top right there uh, in my, uh, this is my uh, 21st year as an ophthalmologist. Uh, and um, this is the first case I've seen where there was spontaneous resolution of ERM uh, with improving vision uh, with uh, you know, over a four year, four year interval. Um, but this is you know, very unusual. So its management options are conservative. If patient is asymptomatic binocularly, relatively good vision. Uh, disease progression is not inevitable, it can remain stable, uh, but the, you know, conversely, the rate of progression uh, can be variable and um, uh, it's difficult to, to predict. Uh, and if patients are lost to long-term uh, follow-up and present with much poorer visual acuity, the, the amount of potential visual improvement is relative to their vision at the time of surgery. So the worse the vision, the further they, they, they will be from you know, potential baseline vision. Uh, we've mentioned about the prognostic, uh, poor prognostic feature in this image. Um, so treatment is surgery with vitrectomy and membrane peeling. I peel both the epiretinal membrane and internal limiting membrane. Not everybody does that. And the reason for doing a double peel is that uh, you do not get patients um, with recurrence of ERM. Um, the, the benefit of uh, surgery is, is uh, stabilization and improvement in vision and improvement in distortion. Uh, and in, this, in a study of 40 eyes, patients that had relatively good vision of 615 or uh, 600 to 615 all had improved uh, vision. The risks are the same with, as, as with other uh, vitrectomy surgeries. Um, so, this is just an example uh, showing peeling of epiretinal uh, membrane. On the left, there is a blue dye that we use. This, that we, the blue dye is on a different patient that shows injection of dye. And then that is removed, the ERM and ILM are, are, are stained, and there's this peeling of the membrane uh, here, and, and it's quite a dense membrane here. 
And finally, a couple more minutes, like advanced diabetic eye disease. So symptoms, the two symptoms, you can have sudden or gradual vision loss. So what's the difference? Uh, so something like vitreous hemorrhage will cause sudden onset visual loss that uh, is often recurrent, uh, whereas uh, diabetic traction retinal detachment uh, is more gradual in onset and does not, spontane does not uh, improve spontaneously. So when you have a patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, uh, and this is showing a patient with new vessel septic optic uh, disc, the, NVE, the NVDs can regress after laser uh, photoregulation uh, or anti vegf it can bleed, uh, and it can, it, can, it can cause uh, lead to scarring and uh, retinal detachment. And this is an example of a, of a patient, uh, left eye vitreous hemorrhage uh, with induced vision and post-op uh, uh, clearing of the visual axis. Uh, here's an example of a patient with retraction retinal uh, detachment, uh, vitrectomy, uh, and um, here I'm, uh, that's been removed off the surface of the retina, and that's scar tissue has just been removed. So in conclusion, uh, we've talked about floaters and PVD, uh, the importance of referring patients urgently, uh, ideally the same day with a retinal tear, retinal detachment or non-diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, we've talked about BMT, macular hole, and retinal membrane, and advanced diabetic eye disease. Uh, I'd just like to end by, by saying that uh, at OCL, uh, we now offer a same day urgent uh, retinal uh, detachment uh, service uh, with a team uh, of us, um, myself and my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, thank you. Uh, happy to take any uh, questions and uh, probably sorry for going slightly over time. Thanks very much, Chen. That was fantastic. Could, would you mind just unsharing your screen? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so we do have quite a few questions, so let's try and get through them. So. Chum, we have a question about floaters. There's a few on floaters, I'll try and summarize them. If we had a patient that came in with floaters, sudden onset floaters, no shave for signs, so no tobacco dust, we did a Volca examination, um, but there was some lattice degeneration that was noted at this visit that hadn't been seen previously. What do we do with that patient? Do we so refer? The patient has floaters, symptoms of floaters. And no other signs but we notice lattice generation for the first time. We've seen them before, nothing previous, but so this is a new lattice generation. So it is likely that the lattice, um, I mean, it's, I mean, lattice can evolve over time, but in the absence of all the other signs, uh, I you, we don't need to refer the patients. Uh, however, the reason why we're here is that if, if this, you have any patient that you are slightly unsure about or um, not completely comfortable with, then just refer and, you know, the, and if, if in dark, you can also, and it's reasonable to see the patient, review the patient in a few weeks, because the time when they're most likely to develop a, a retinal break is the first six weeks. Thanks, Chen. Um, how about if there's floaters and there's vitreal synoresis, um, no PVD, do we have to do a dilated exam or is an optomac or optos enough? I think if, if you have a patient with symptomatic floaters, I would do a dilated examination. Uh, yes, the, the, you know, a ultra white field retinal imaging, you know, such as the Optos is great. Uh, however, it doesn't have the same uh, degree of res resolution in the peripheral retina as we have with our natural retina when we're examining through, you know, through the, net, the, the optics of, of, a, of a slit lamp. So, you know, I would say a clinical examination uh, is important because the Optos may not pick up, you know, really subtle things or more subtle things. Talking about examination, Chen, do you use the headset with binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy and do you do scleral indentation or do you rely just on your Volk? Yeah, that's a very good question. So, um, so the key is to get the Volk lens as close to the patient's cornea as possible. Uh, I don't routinely uh, indent, I, I don't routinely perform scleral indentation with indirect ophthalmoscopy. Um, I do if there is a really anterior lesion that I'm, that I, you know, I'm slightly uncertain about, then I intend to get a dynamic kind of 3D view uh, in, in slightly more detail. But no, I mean, routinely, I, I do not, I, I do not use it. Um, and just to confirm, asymptomatic retinal holes, we do not need to refer. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Can a vitrectomy for floaters be done in the NHS if it's affecting someone's quality of life? I think that, that, is, a, that is a difficult one, isn't it? I think if, if there is significant reduction in vision, um, you know, I think if there is objective um, reduction in vision, you know, 612 or, or worse, then yes. I mean, if somebody with 6669 vision, um, you know, in the current climate where we're having to, to, you know, we've got such a big backlog in the NHS with all the, you know, all the different cases, that we've got, all the non-urgent cases that we're waiting for months, you know, after round three of lockdown, uh, you know, they're going to be very, very low. You know, it's, they're unlikely to be, to be offered. Thanks, Chen. Um, a question about tobacco dust. What happens after you, what happens to the tobacco dust once you've done the laser retina effects? Does it disappear? So, so that is dispersion of retinal pigment epithelial cells um, from the site of the retinal tear. So that, that stays in the MP vitreous. So that, that, that stays there. Okay. Um, how about, how do you decide whether you're going to use silicon oil or gas for retinal detachment surgery? It's a good technical question. Somebody who knows a lot about retinal detachment. Um, so silicon oil is usually used if there is any um, sign of retinal scarring or PVR, uh, where there's you know chronicity or contraction or membranes that that's um, and the retina is quite stiff, and that those cases tend not to do as well with gas. So silicon oil is usually used uh, in that situation or giant retinal tears, particularly in the bottom half uh, of the of the retina. Um, we do have quite a few, so Chen, I'm going to try and get through as many as we can. What would the vision need to be before you would consider treating a VMT or an ERM? Uh, it's a com combination of the patient's symptoms. Um, so in terms of vision, um, we often consider Snellen visual acuity, which is the, the, you know, the basis of all our examinations. However, um, there are quite a few patients that have uh, more reduction in their near vision, and that is certainly worth uh, testing because sometimes you, you will be surprised that, that that is significantly reduced. So, in the standard acuity, I, I would say you know, usually 612, uh, 69 is, is usually you know, about my, my cutoff. It really depends on their symptoms. Um, you know, and, and about 69. Um, Jim, you got a question about macular holes. You mentioned that the prevalence of a fellow eye developing a macular hole is about 20% in five years. Are there any benef benefits of prophylaxis treatment to the other eye then? A vitrectomy to reduce the risks or anything like that? Um, on balance, no. I mean, there's an 80% chance of retinal hole, but a macular hole will not develop. Um, so to do, an, to do an operation, you would have to do a lot of, uh, a lot of patients to, you know, uh, the number needed, needed to treat, you know, may not be acceptable. So no, yeah, that, that is, you know, the, you are exposing a patient to, you know, potential risk of surgery and they're likely to get cataract uh, earlier um, and, and they may never develop a macular hole. So that's not generally practiced. Okay. Um, something about diabetes. Is it appropriate to refer a diabetic patient with known diabetic retinopathy for vitreous hemorrhage? And what is the likelihood that this would have been present at their diabetic screening appointment, for, say, perhaps a few weeks ago? Um, is it appropriate? Yeah, absolutely. It's just whether it's, if it's non-diabetic, then you need to refer urgently. If it's diabetic, then it doesn't have to be urgent because the, the cause is known. You may want to refer urgently if it's a patient with a diabetic vitreous hemorrhage that has never had laser treatment, uh, PRP laser um, for proliferative disease. But if it's somebody who's known to the, the eye service and has had previous laser treatment or injection for proliferative disease, then it, it does not need to be urgent. Um, can they, can, can, it, can it develop? Well, yeah, I mean, a vitreous hemorrhage can develop, you know, instantly, you know, it's traction of the vitreous on some all new blood vessels or, exist, you know, or perfused blood vessels, you know, new blood vessels. So it can develop at any moment. So yes. Um, Chen, what are the levels for the NHS in terms of treating a macular hole in terms of vision? So at what point would the, the NHS treat a macular hole? Uh, 6, 12 or worse, typically. Okay, so 
um, we've got someone asking, are we missing the best opportunity to treat it fast within one week of symptoms if their vision obviously hasn't dropped to less than 612? So it's the best call, call of call private. So, so those are patients, um, sorry, my slide wasn't clear. Those are patients that achieve six over 7.5 vision after surgery. So that they didn't, did, did not present the six over 7.5. Um, so that's the second part of the question. Um, so they presented with, with worse, worse vision. Um, in terms of the, I mean, that was one study, um, um, you know, I think there would need to be a lot more data um, before uh, these patients, uh, you know, would, could be, you know, potentially be prioritized uh, higher in the NHS, but, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, that is, that is unlikely to happen. You know, I think if, if, if I, you know, knew somebody close to me that developed a, a macular hole, I, you know, I would want, want it done as soon as possible because the, the, it, if, if you think about it from a physiological point of view, you, you can understand why uh, treatment sooner could potentially lead to a better outcome and that data from last year's paper potentially supports that. So, you know, I think if you have the option that's worth considering about the NHS, it's certainly not you know, urgent. Thanks, Chen. I think I am going to leave the questions here. Um, I do just want to share my screen if that's okay. There's just a few things that I want to go through before I launch the poll, which people will need to um, complete actually. So just a few final things. Um, just to talk about OCL, Chen, I don't know whether you want to just talk about our specialities that we have at OCL. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank you. So we cover all the uh, major uh, specialties. Um, so we've got uh, eight consultants now, uh, and we are growing uh, very rapidly. So we've got everything from cornea to glaucoma to eyelid surgery to medical and surgical retina. Um, so, you know, kind of cover the, the, the wide range of things. Um, so yes, you know, we, we, you know there's, there's always somebody available uh, at uh, our flagship uh, centre at New Cavendish Street if you have any urgent patients that we've seen. Thank you, Chen. And just a reminder that we do have a WhatsApp group for optometrists. Um, and if you wanted to scan the QR code, it will take you to that. Our consultants weekly will post a case study review. Other optometrists also post um, OCT scans or pictures or queries from patients they've seen in clinic. So it's a good chance, it's some great learning. I know I've learned a lot from, from other people in this group as well. So if you do want to join, feel free to scan this QR code and you will be um, added to that group and you can enjoy our weekly training sessions that we're very lucky to have with the consultants. And finally, before I go to the poll, I just want to share with you our next webinar will be given by Ramesh Anganawella, and that's on Thursday, the 25th of March at seven o'clock, and it's on keratoconus, and it's modern treatment modalities. It's going to be another great one, so I will post the link in the WhatsApp groups, and you will get it via email, but if you wanted to register, if you wanted to do it now, now is your time to, to get that done. We look forward to seeing you there. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to hit the poll. So everybody, please, if you could, just fill in a quick poll, just to let us know what you thought in the form of reflection. Um, and whilst the poll's being done, I just want to say thank you so much for a fantastic webinar. We've had already had lots of positive feedback, I can see, so it's been, it's been brilliant. Thank you, Ruvia. Thank you, everybody, for, for attending in the, in the evening, and thank you for all the, all the really interesting uh, questions. If there are any questions that haven't been answered, please do email me um, at pulvi at ocrvision.com and I will get them over to Chen and I will try to respond to as many of them as I can. So please feel free to, to send me an email and I will get those answered or just pop them in the WhatsApp group. I'm sure Chen will be over later at some point to answer them. And that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I look forward to seeing you next month the next webinar. Thank you, Chen. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming.